I, I will tell you that Congressman Thad McConner has been with us a couple of times, and he is running hard. There's no doubt about it. McConner2012.com is his website, and uh, each and every time that Thad's been here, we get uh, tremendous response, great emails and tweets from people going, hey, you know, I... I kind of like what this guy is saying and uh, hoping that he gets a little more traction. So uh, happy to uh, welcome him here this morning. Congressman, good morning. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. So uh, the campaign now is in earnest. Would, would that be Paul, uh, the correct thing to say? Oh, it, it's starting up generally harder after Labor Day in terms of how the public views it. They start to focus. I think that that's great. Yeah. All right. So, so the question becomes, what is it that's really separating Thad McConnor from anybody else? Well, there's three things. There's the call not to just simply cut government, but to fundamentally restructure for the 21st century. Second is to restructure and fix the failed Wall Street bailout banks. And third is to defend America from all enemies, including terrorists, tyrants, and communist China's strategic threat. Uh, no one else seems to be willing to raise these issues. No one else seems to be able to discuss, especially regarding the contraction of credit in the country, how to fix the banks, because many of them support the Wall Street bailout or either unable or unwilling to deal with it. Mm-hmm. So right off the bat. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the banks for a second, because I think it's fascinating. I, there's, a, there's a quote from you that I have passed along to so many people. Uh, your quote was, when you tell banks they can make money without lending money, what do you think is going to happen? And, and you know, it's brilliant in its simplicity, and it's simple in its brilliance. And you're seeing it. You're seeing it now starting to be recognized. Uh, that the debt deflation period that we're going through is being recognized finally by people like Bernanke, finally by people in the in the European community, which are dealing with the same problem over there. Unfortunately, it seems to be a question of the political class. Outside of that, it seems to be unaware of what's going on, and they continue to try to treat it with traditional Keynesian or traditional monetary policies, and that's not what we're going through. Right. What about China? Because I, I hear people who are, well, they seem like they're terrified to talk about it. You look at the debt, man. We are a wholly owned subsidiary of China these days. Well, it's the debt, it's the cyber spying, it's the counterfeiting, it's the dumping. It's a currency manipulation. It's their new aircraft carrier. It's their announcement. They're intensifying the quantity and quality of their nuclear stockpiles. Now, the list goes on and on, and yet people seem to be chary about doing this. And that is not something you can have in a commander-in-chief and the president of the United States. So what do we do? How, how do you combat the threat of China? Well, I think the first thing to do is to recognize it. The second thing to do is treat all of their trade violations as a comprehensive whole. We're going to have to get our fiscal house in order, so as you rightly point out, we no longer owe a massive amount of money to a communist nuclear-armed dictatorship. Mm-hmm. I think we also, we also have to demand equality of reciprocity of investment. They can't simply come over here and invest in the United States and then have us go through the hoops to try to even start something there. Mm-hmm. And, I would re- and I would reattach trade uh, to trade with communist China, the qualification of human rights. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the current occupant of the uh, Oval Office. I mean, this is, has been fascinating as he announced publicly that he was coming to your house. And then when the, the folks who uh, operate your house said, hey, we've got other plans, uh, it was, of course, derided as a terrible, terrible personal affront. Well, I think what the president tried to do is very transparent. He tried to set up a situation where he's going to win either way. Yeah. Whether he come in on the first night back and upset the Republican debate at the Reagan Library, or he could whine about not being allowed in until the next day. Now, look, it's a separate equal branch of government. Uh, the president made his request. The speaker set it up the next day after the president's request. I don't know if that's something uh, that gives him grounds to carp. Well, I think everything gives him grounds to carp. I think the, I think the fact that we are mired in the situation we are in uh, gives him grounds, because uh, otherwise people look at him and say, hey, what are you doing? Well, he doesn't have policies that are going to work, and it doesn't matter whether he addresses us on Wednesday, whether he addresses us on Thursday, uh, whether or not he addresses us uh, in a week from now. It's not going to work, and that's the problem. It's not a problem of him lacking the bully pulpit or having to drag the bully pulpit into a joint session of Congress. Right. Now, let, let's talk about the campaign for a couple of moments, uh, Thad. The uh, uh, the top tier, we're told over and over again, uh, is Mitt Romney, Rick Perry, Michelle Bachman, and that uh, all the rest of you guys, you know, you're running, but it's, it's strictly second tier. Now, you don't buy that, obviously. Well, obviously, the national media has not covered our campaign. <laughs> yeah. But yet you still see the progress make, we're making in places like Iowa and New Hampshire is creep, seeping into the national polling. Finally, they're putting us on there. We've seen Gallup showed us tied with people 
mm -hmm. uh, that are going to be on the stage at the Reagan Library or slightly behind some of them. Right. You're seeing us tying Quinnipiac tied with people who are going to be on the Reagan Library stage or slightly behind some of them. And that's without spending the millions of dollars collectively or the time, the years that some of them have done it, and the national media coverage that you get. Look, I'm not going to be in Vogue magazine. I'm not going to be in Esquire. Fine. Right. But we're reaching real people, and it's starting to seep up. But what you see is you start to see how the press likes to determine, you know, if they make the rules, they determine who gets in. But I'm just going to keep plugging away because, in the end, the people of New Hampshire are going to decide that state's primary. The people of Iowa are going to decide that state's caucus. Yeah. And that's how the process works. But it's got to be difficult. Uh, uh, it's certainly difficult to raise money. It's got to be frustrating on a personal level to be running as hard as you are and then either be not invited or be disinvited uh, to debates with the so-called leading candidates. What I find fascinating is how, is how they want to shape it yeah. and, how, and how the media is going to tell you what the candidates are. Now, look, I can understand that there's, that there's, you know, there's only so much room if you've got so many people. Right. But the reality is, look, I've been a member of Congress for nine years. Right. I was in House leadership for four years. I've been in rooms with presidents that have talked about issues of war and peace. Uh, and this is not particularly a fringe candidacy here. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's just a question of eventually I trust the people. And if you trust the American people as a candidate, you have to take your message to them. Yeah. And it seems to be resonating wherever we are. What about the money front? Again, it's got to be difficult to raise money for a campaign when the, uh, when the national press says, uh, Thad who? Yeah, but you have to remember, you also have to continue to marshal your resources. And because it's a primary state, New Hampshire, mm -hmm. that's true. If you also have two congressional districts and they expect you to come to them before you even get to the point where you start running TV ads or things like that, so you right. get traction in the state. Iowa being a caucus state, it's the same thing. So we've seen people with millions of dollars already leave the race. Are you going to the, uh, to the joint session of Congress, or will you have other things to do? Oh, it'll be on the 8th. I'll be in the joint session. Okay. I was just curious. I don't know. I mean, it, it just, I, I, if I were in your situation, I don't know that I could sit in a chair and listen to this guy uh, waste yet another 30 or 40 minutes of my time knowing that there's actually a pretty good football game on at the same time. <laughs> well, I'm a Lions guy, so that wouldn't be my concern. <laughs> All right. Well, Thad McConner, it's good to have you here. I know you're making your way to uh, New Hampshire next week. I urge people to check out the website, McConner2012.com, and uh, you'll get out and meet and greet people while you're in New Hampshire, I'd imagine. Absolutely. All right, Congressman. Thanks so much, buddy. Congressman Thad McConner, he's from uh, Detroit, Michigan, and uh, he's running for president. Now, look, he's a serious candidate. Uh, is he considered to be the top tier? I guess it depends on who you ask is in the top tier. Right. And as he points out, it is this national media that sort of makes that decision for all of us, whether we want it made or not.